recording. Joe Mitchum, absolute pleasure to have you at the HR studio. And I can't continue the introduction without giving uh, Mr. Paul Godonis a thank you for the intro. Paul Godonis, legend. I am legend head. Yeah, massive Swede. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mate, great to have you here. Great to have you here. Um, author extraordinaire. Getting there. Reg extraordinaire. Sigs extraordinaire. Yeah, long in the teeth, but still there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, generally excited to talk to you. I am, I think we're talking off air. The whole process of writing fascinates me. I've got authors in the family. It's always something that's interested me. I have, I've, I want to say it in inverted commas loosely, I've written a book before, a published book, but it's not, it's not a story per se, it's a manual. So it's, it's a very different thing to put together than what you do, story writing essentially. Um, and I've always, everyone has their own, I think, well, you tell me if I'm wrong, every writer probably has their own little unique way of going about things. And it must be an incredibly difficult and challenging process every time, I think, to go from idea for a story to, however that's inspired, to realize something or just a thought you have in your head to your book being on a shelf somewhere. How do you do it? Yeah, well, I I came up like I say sparks with an idea. Um, sitting watching the news, terror atrocities going on. Police saying, "Oh, the the perpetrator was known to the authorities. They were on the UK terror watch list." And I guess as like most people like us would do, would sit there and go, "Oh, if I had that list, what would I do with that list?" So I just came up with the story of what what a load of sort of veterans, ex-elite, special forces guys with that terror watch list, what would they do with it? Maybe go after the worst ones off the top of it. Um, so I just had this idea. I had loads of time in my plan because I'd just finished doing a degree, six years spent writing sort of 20 hours a week. Um, I finished that by a few months and uh, I just thought, I've got, got to be doing something a bit more constructive. So I just started writing this idea. Probably written about two or three chapters of, of the story with no idea of how to write a story. It never crossed my mind, never been anything I wanted to do. Um, so I just looked up, how do you write fiction? And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, up comes uh, how to write fiction for dummies <laughs> on Amazon. So uh, ordered that book, read it cover to cover. That was pretty much my Bible. Um, so I learned that what I had been doing, just sitting there writing what was coming out of my head, that's the the seat of the pants method, which is a, fine as a method if that's that suits what your story is and the way you write. Um, but then I re read on about the snowflake method, which is more about having a framework, uh, so like building a structure like a snowflake, and then sort of filling that in, fill the gaps in with the the text. Um, so from there, I, I sort of learnt um, what my method was going to be. It's a bit of a combination of both because. If you get an idea for a chapter, oh, I've got this brilliant action scene in my head. You just smash that out. It doesn't matter about the structure. Just get it out. Um, but yeah, I had to develop a, you have like a spreadsheet for my book. So you have, you have layers of a story. So you have the free act format. Well, in fact, the first la level of the book is like your, your, your one sentence. What encapsulates still to UK terror watch this and go after the bad guys would be the one top level. Then your free act format breaks that down into your start, middle, and end. Uh, obviously, you start, middle, and end all broken down into chapters. Each chapter broken down into scenes where where sort of it moves from one place to another, different conversations start and end. Um, scenes broken down into uh, paragraphs, paragraphs broken down into sentences, down to words. So they're the layers of the story, and you can plan that down. You can't really plan it much below um scene level but i've got a spreadsheet that maps out the free act format the chapters and the scenes um what, for every book you do yeah and then there's a column with a timeline on so i can i know what day the um story starts on so as you go through you might write five or six chapters and want to refer to something back and say i oh, remember six days ago when this happened you you've got that timeline there so you know how much time has passed so if it's a, a long uh, duration, you'll know which season you've come and gone into, so you can write in what sort of weather you should have. So it's like a logbook of a fictional Absolutely. story, right? And the, the other really useful thing is if um, 
like so if you've got other things going on in your life it's not my main thing writing so i might have five or six weeks where i, I don't get any chance to write instead of having to go back and read the manuscript through, through 20 30 thousand words to get my head back into it i can just read through the there's one sentence for each chapter there's one sentence for each, each clip you just read that take you five minutes and then you're straight back into writing where you were um so that that's the main sort of supporting document I use to write a book. Uh, but also I've got a character bible. <coughs> so you, you know you've got your, your personality pen picture files that you might write for your um, chain of command so or your, your CO's biog. Um, Explain got, that for Sif Pop who listening, what you're talking about there. So uh, it's, it's almost like a, a one-page form with it might have a photograph, name, age, address, all, all your details um a personnel file essentially right? yeah yeah and HR everything i say about the character in the book or books uh, i log in that because if you imagine in book one chapter six i say alex has got a sister who's 25 and lives here there or whoever um i'll write that in alex's character file because if i come two books down the line and alex's sister appears again I've got to then leaf through the first book and find where I've said what about Alex's sister. But when you use a character Bible, that's all there. I just look at Alex's page. Oh, he's got a sister. She's 26. Is that a normal ca is character Bible a normal thing for authors, is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I learned about that in this uh, How to Write Fiction for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> it's a key takeaway. Um, so I've got that. I've also got um, a places file. So as a story transitions from Birmingham to London and wherever else it goes, I, I, I try, because there's a lot of geography in my books because it's all about being around in the UK and different things happening in different places. Um, I, I use real addresses. And if it's like house number 26 at a certain road, obviously I can't put someone's real address in there. Someone lives there. So I'll sort of tweak the uh, address name. So like Elm Street might become Lime Street or some, something similar to that. Um but the actual addresses and the postcodes, I keep track of those, so I know where everything is. So if someone has to travel from one of the addresses I mentioned to another, I, I can work out how far it is, what roads they take, what they see on the route. Uh, so all the geography is really realistic, and you can take the tours of the books because you can work out where everything is. Uh, so I was up at Sunderland last week. Sunderland features in the third book. Um, and walking down by the river where this maritime festival was going to take place, I was like, oh, this is where that happens. Oh, that's where so-and-so gets shot in the head. And, yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, so you think it's pretty important to, do you think it's pretty important when, when you put in these places where events happen in the book, do you think it's better to have them be in places you've actually been to then? Yeah, definitely having that experience. Um, yeah, help, helps keep it real. Um, try trying to make something up in your head is much harder to describe than something you've actually lived and experienced. Um, and yeah, the more experience you've got on a place helps. Obviously, Google Earth comes into it, so I couldn't go back and re recce Sunderland or um, St James's Park in London or all, all the places that they put into the book. I can't continually keep going back and, and wreck in, especially at this stage, where it's kind of still a bit of a hobby. I uh, haven't got the time or the, or the resources to do that. So, yeah, writing from experience with a bit of help from Google Earth um, makes it achievable. Map Rapid map, rapid, look, map rapid comes first, don't it? Yeah. Time. <laughs> um, or Google Earth, I know, yeah. Uh, you, chose, uh, you, <coughs> you chose a pretty, what can be a very divisive subject and a very touchy subject. Uh, and not the, not that, not towing the, sort of p p not political line not that pc a subject uh a subject to write about um was that what came into the decision process with that now obviously with the with the caveat that not even the caveat was that because is that because of your experience military experience that you decided to write but we wrote about um, not necessarily your own opinions to communicate in the in the books, but definitely the, I mean the way you describe certain things, the way you, it, it's it's obvious that you've got a deep military experience. You've been in a lot of places. You've experienced a lot of things. 
they're also very in touch with the sort of societal aspect of it, the political aspect of it. Really, really dangerous area, potentially dangerous area to go down to write about. What, why that path in terms of story? Like I say, the the idea struck me, and it's it's purely because it is that emotive and. Emotive I think, I think art, art in terms of not only writing but songwriting, um, anything that sort of stirs the emotion, is is that's what's going to help you to come up with a decent story. I couldn't write a really interesting story about anything that didn't stir emotion because then you you try and create create something from nothing. So you, having that almost dangerous situation where you, you, you're messing with what people think and um, playing with ideas that are really controversial um, because people are getting a bit polarised on things um, across society with different topics i think uh yeah the way to deal with potential terrorists unconvicted people that may have done nothing other than be in the same room as someone that has been doing something bad um to then go preemptive strike and potentially like the vigilante scenario that's in the book really yeah it people will be like oh you couldn't possibly do that other people are like no that's what we should be doing it's that it's that friction that yeah, dichotomy that really makes a story. Um, uh, it, it's that that friction that makes things interesting in writing, down to like individual characters. So I was talking about my character bible. Um, one of the things I've learned to do is to have um, sort of goals and aspirations of each character and, and values, <coughs> but you have to make at least two of them conflict with each other. So even without interacting with other characters, one character can cause friction and um, generate sort of uh, activity without any other interaction, purely because they've got a conflict within themselves. So if uh, one of the characters' thing is, I don't want anyone to be hurt, I want to keep everyone safe, but in order to achieve that goal, they've got to kill someone or harm someone, or then that, that conflict, that, that internal struggle generates the the sort of interest in the story so yeah the the complexities of what's right and wrong um how far should you go to um sort of achieve your goals that all comes into it in individual characters and the whole storyline and that, that hopefully makes it a lot more interesting how do you select characters how do you decide what characters you can have in there you, is that is that something that's preempted before you start writing when you're planning the book? Is that something you you want to find before you start writing, or do you let char- like character de- not development, but it's like an organic process. So the the basic outline of the story requires to have the the signals technician who's a bit of a geek and doesn't really want to put himself in harm's way. He's there to go and steal the terror watch list then you've got the the sf type hard-nosed characters that are going to need to be there one's kind of a mentor to him others are almost like bully characters um then there's uh lucy butler who's the ink or corporal who becomes like the the love interest and then gets tagged into the the team um obviously I, i i have characters based on people I know that are kind of slotted in to the story where where it suits but I don't I don't tailor the storyline to fit them in it's only for convenience if if I can make it work um equally some of the characters are, are not based on anyone they're just people I conjure up and use elements of uh people's personalities that I know to help build them together so yeah it's it's like I say it's very organic and natural they they tend to meld themselves in my head. It's not a conscious thing usually that I'll I'll build a a character based on just things that I want to put in. They they kind of make themselves. It's hard to explain. No, <coughs> it's interesting. It's interesting. How much research do you put into it when you write in into the book? So a, a huge amount of it is evident that is from your own knowledge and experiences from you know characters to 
strategy tactics to the way they're talking. Um, but what about on those areas where you may have less understanding, especially on the secret service side of things, on the intelligence side of uh, intelligence uh, practices and organization side of things? Well, how would you go about doing that kind of research as well? Yeah, there's um, yeah quite a lot of uh, research done, like you say, on the um, the sort of security service side of things. Uh, GCHQ features in the second book, or oh, sorry, third book. Um, Port and Downs in the second book. Um, Port and Down, fucking hell. Yeah, so I've lived in that place for a long time. There's like the the <laughs> urban military legends of what what might happen there and. Um, you have a go. Have, no, I've do. never been. I, we went before the Iraq 2003 war, port and down. <laughs> come on, carry on. I'll come on, I'll come on to it later. Yeah, yeah. Fucking weird place. Eerie place. So, for people listening or watching, port and down is where they do a lot of the um, CBRN testing, chemical, biological uh, attack, and defense testing. That kind of yeah, ner- horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Nerve horrible, agent defense. Horrible stuff. And yeah, horrible stuff. Yeah. Lots of animals have lost their lives <laughs> in that place. <laughs> anyway, go on. Yeah, so th- things like that. Some some things I might have heard about or known about or know a bit about, I'll, I'll dig in and find as much research as I can to the point where I know enough to make anything I make up sound tangible. Um, so there's there's stuff in there that's true. There's stuff in there that's open source, easy to research. Um, and then there's there's things I I know from other experience that might not be directly relevant, but I can I can use it to make sort of embellish around what I know about other things to make it sound more plausible. So, um, hopefully there's a good sort of blur in the line of what I do know and what I don't know, and what what's made up, and so it kind of leaves it open to um, interpretation as to what you what you choose to believe. Um, How long before you get that first seed and idea, <clears throat> you decide to put pen to paper? Um, in terms of writing a, a full on manuscript, it will depend on where it fits into the story. So, um, the idea, the main, the main culmination of action in the second book for Tony Blunt, I had as an idea that came up whilst I was writing the first book. It took me three years to w- write the watch list because it was very low priority hobby and just something that was in the background. The watch list being the first book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't really know where <laughs> this incident um, that ended up in Tony Blunt, whether that would just be a standalone book on its own or if it formed part of a story in, in the series. At, at that point, I didn't know what there was going to be a series. Uh, subsequently, I've planned the seven book strategy. Um, but yeah, you, you have to write the idea down straight away even in note form so um I've, the, I've got the idea for the whole book the whole yeah well, story. so for the incident as an isolated incident um so say you have an idea about a sabotage of a car in a certain way that will make a crash happen it'll be terrible and awful and 15 people will die um if you've got that fixed idea you have to write that down even if it's less than a page on on the computer just just tap tap it down and and save it somewhere um equally if you have a really good idea for a scene and it, it turns into a four thousand word chapter then then get that done and even if it's not in the book you're working on or um you don't use it for years to come just writing it down and capturing it because I've, I've had so many good ideas that i thought that's such a good idea i don't need to write it down because i'll never forget that wake up the next morning <laughs> um, so I, sometimes I find myself laying in bed at night I have a brilliant idea I'll just get my phone open a little note file write, write down the basics of it and then, then I can sleep peacefully <laughs> <laughs> so um, three years so why was it three years to write the first book so I was working on the Sunderland Tall Ships program first regu- proper job after leaving the regular army Um I was doing a bit of reserves work on the side and the, the job got really busy. Um, first time living at home uh, with a, I think eldest daughter was seven at the time. So it was, it was just really busy. And um, most of my free time is in the evenings um, where you think, oh, you can just 
get your laptop out, but the wife doesn't really like me just sitting there next to. It looks like I'm working if I'm if I'm writing. So, yeah, the opportunities well, to write. Are, you are working. Yeah. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not fool how you do the well, same thing. The let's between? not kid ourselves on. There's 100 percent working. There's a there's a what was what did I hear recently? In, in the, it was an Italian. I think you phrase it as an Italian proverb, an Italian phrase, and it's uh, the 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 art of doing nothing. Yeah, like a lesson. I, you know, it, one of, one of the things that interests me when you, we were talking, even on the phone the other week when we were talking last week when we were talking about this, is uh, why you started writing, and it's like, uh, you know, you, you said you were writing twenty thousand words for uni a week. Fucking hell, that's a lot. Of, that's like that's because people think oh, twenty thousand words. That's not a lot to write. Yeah, but it, it is when you got to factor in the brain power that goes in to decide what you're going to write. It's not just, it's just like a you know, typewriter, just automatically typing it all out. It's like thinking time goes into it. But then that got removed and you need to plug your t- you need to plug that void with something else. <clears throat> you know, uh, the art of doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm on board with your wife there. Like, stand down sometimes. I But it's a hard lesson to learn. Hard yeah. lesson to learn, but then three, yeah. books, three books come out of it. So yeah, three years <laughs> did the first one, uh, but then Tall Ships finished, and um, I I got into a reserves job, which was only going to be part time, and I wrote the second book, Where Is Tony Blunt, in five months. Okay. Um, so that was a ninety-seven thousand words, um, and that that was as far as first draft. Obviously, it took a, a while to process and get proofreaders all over it and <coughs> get it all formatted for. For, for printing and then I was probably on for about the same sort of timeline for the third book uh, but then I got into another bit of work um, that, that slowed me down a bit and I'm still on that now um, so 14 months for the third book uh, that's start to finish though that was from first words to publication and I, I did waste a lot of time between books because I, I wasn't writing anything new whilst I was preparing the manuscripts for publication getting through all the, the military checks I have to go through um, so this time I decided I'm just going to start writing the fourth one um, oh, so you, still have to get them, you still have to get them signed off then do you? yeah well anyone um, serving or ex-serving um, is advised to if you're still serving you have to but you're advised to use there's a defence information note with, or now as DINs about publication of um, of books for uh, military authors or anyone writing anything about the military because whether you're military or not, if you write stuff about the military and the mili- military say, actually, that's against official secrets or that, that breaches our national security, then they can basically sue you and tell you to take off the market. Whereas if you follow the process laid down in this defence information note... Um, you submit the manuscript to Defence Department of Communications. They'll then um, read through it. Any OPSEC or PERSEC operational or personal uh, security issues, they, they, they'll highlight back to you. Otherwise, they'll give it a, a tick in the box. If there's any other departments like um, uh, JTAC um, is, is the, it was the issue in the latest book, um, uh, Port and Down, um, DSF, Special Forces, a- any of those departments <coughs> that they think, oh, they'll be interested in this, then they'll send them a copy and then wait for them to give them the tick in the box. Once you've got all the ticks in the box and you've had it signed off by the... If, you, if you're still serving, the commanding officer needs to sign it off for you as well. Um, and then they'll issue a letter of a approval saying, yeah, okay, we've got no issues with this. You get go ahead and there's no comebacks once you've got that letter they also give you the paragraph that goes in the front of the book about um all, all the ideas contained in this book are those of the author and not reflective of the um of uh of the uk military oh yeah i'm looking now oh yeah here you go got it i'm looking at your book right now the views and opinions expressed are those of the author alone and should not be taken to represent those of a majesty's government MOD, hm armed forces or any government agency okay yeah, so anyone wants to write anything about the military, get it to DDC, get them to sign off. They'll give you a letter and the paragraph, and you're good to go. So how do people get away with writing books? Well, do not toe that line. 
people like Art Middleton, people like other people who are out there authoring books and you read them, not that I've read Ant's books, mind. But you go, oh my God, how are you getting away with saying stuff like that? Well, because they get away with it. Yeah, there's this. You say about getting away with it. You can write. You can write. Chief of De- Defence Staff is a complete arsehole, and I uh, shagged his wife. <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't have any comeback on that because there's, there's no operational security. There's no. Um, yeah, so the the things they check for are fairly, fairly fixed. They can't they can't take a view on whether it's showing them in a good light or a bad light. It has to be security issues so uh, whether they like it or not there's there's certain things they're looking for and there's certain things that are on their criteria to get that sign off and just saying nasty things about the army isn't necessarily going to stop them from uh, or trying to get you to stop it getting to publish mm. okay and by the way I do like the CGS I think he's a great blick Got <laughs> <laughs> in there. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. Uh, <laughs> do you find it a cathartic experience writing like this? Because I know a lot of your own personal experiences are interwoven into the books, right? Little anecdotal stories and uh, some of the major stuff, you know. And like um, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned Fob Robinson in the second book. I know, you know, you, you served. Uh, Fob Rob, uh, sang in Afghan. Um, yeah, find it a cathartic experience, or do you find it quite emotionally draining, or a bit of both? Um, I f- it's almost like a therapy. Uh, quite. Um, yeah, I think it's better to get things out on a page rather than keep them stored up. No, I, I don't. <coughs> I don't profess to have any sort of worries, mental health wise, and. Um, hard to explain it's good to get it get it out but i don't feel like i need to get it out. i'm not i'm not writing this because i've got pent up stress and I, I need to to sort of cleanse myself of it it's just hopefully i express things in a way that help other people or people read that i think yeah that's that's what i feel and that's yeah it reflects the way it is and um, being authentic as a writer to military readers veterans or serving I, w- I want squaddies to read my stuff and go, oh yeah, he's bang on there. That's, yeah, I'm glad someone said it like that because that's that's the way it is, sort of thing. Yeah, we were talking earlier in the in the in the uh, in the in the club clubhouse there about that. Uh, where in the first book, <coughs> you know, you're talking about um, there's a discussion going on between you know ex SF guys uh, and well, a bunch of people who are on the verge of some vigilante action, you know, and talking through the ethics of it and the morals of it. And it's obviously revol- I don't want to give spoilers away, you know, you know, revol- you know um, revolves around uh, uh, terrorism here in the UK. Um, and they discuss the ethics of it and the morals of it. You know, the, the, the subject of religion comes up, the subject of skin color comes up. And I thought that the way that conversation was written, the way you wrote that conversation was fucking brilliant. Because uh, to me, I I read it thought that 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 ref, that reflects exactly what I would expect from m- my peer group if they were having that conversation in that situation, you know. Um, and it's in a as, as positive a light of that conversation can be. I thought it was really well done, really well done. As, and again, going back to going on broaching subjects that are very emotive and very divisive. Uh, especially in this day and age, especially how polarized the right and the left are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when you, that kind of a discussion, when it's in the written format in the way that it is there, it's something you can't really argue with. You can't, you can't, you can't argue or shut down a paragraph. You have to fucking read it, you know, whether you agree with it or not. And because of the way it's written, I thought it was, I thought it was really good. Sort of, sort of a, a, um, uh, a reality check. You know, for this is actually a very good example of how people think. Certain people think. Certain areas of society think. Not all, you know. And it, and it's not in a. It's not painted in a right wing way. It's not painted in some fucking 
fascist, neo-Nazi way. It's not some sort of racist football hooligan way. It's a measured, decent conversation about the about a very difficult subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you come across any any characters like that in real life, or situations like that in real life? Um, not so much in real life, but uh, I think more and more you see it on social media now with some of the like, general posts you see. I, I get lots of friend requests from um, veterans from across the spectrum on like Facebook. And normally I'm just, yeah, be friends with anyone to work up to the 5,000 limit. But um, sometimes you look at people's profile pages. Yeah, sometimes I, I find myself looking at people's profile pages and uh, there's just so much hatred and negativity and outright racism that uh, I just don't really feel the need to have them in my life. And uh, I'll just sort of say thank you, but no thank you. Um, yeah, I really wanted to, although it is the vigilante thing in the book of going after unconvicted people, um, it was quite a strong and um, sort of controversial, potentially abhorrent storyline. Uh, I didn't want to have it connected in any way to racism. It had to be purely about blokes like us going after the threat. And it's not about a threat of a colour or, or a religion. It's purely down to the intent of those people that do harm to us. So, yeah, having that, having that argument spelled out, um, people put in their sort of views on the line in open forum uh, I think it helped sort of make sure there was none of that potential for the book to be seen as something that was just a racist horrible yeah it does make you rant. think though it does make you think it's got, it does prompt thought you know I was thinking about that and I still think now in that story oh man it is such a fucking grey area it is such a grey area as to whether I would go yeah I'm happy to be involved in this or not because, like you said, unconvicted, um, unconvicted, but there's a wealth of intelligence there. Uh, and again, don't don't want to spoil this, but it does make you think: what what would you do? What action would you take? What what would you be? What decisions would you be willing to make to inform those actions? Um, uh, yeah, it's hard. And you're back to but the social media thing. I know. It, I tell you what I take, try and take comfort in the moment is, is that I don't. So what you see on social media, is I am beginning more and more to believe that is nowhere near what society is like. I think you literally got we've got a, a world of people where we are. It's they're like Jekyll and Hyde. You got pe most people. I think the, those ones are your experience now. They're the, the, not experiencing now, but the racism, the 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 bigots the racists that they present themselves online they ain't like that in real life most of them they ain't they they I don't think so which is a positive thing I think they mm. are just plain they not playing the algorithm but they just trapped in that attention thing they want likes they want attention they want shares they want comments on their stories and if they and if they're getting that because they say uh, very um, inflammatory things or statements, you know. Then that's what they're doing. But it's only online, I think, most of the time. It, I, I, I mean, if it was, if if the real world was like what the online world is now, my God, you walked on the high street without seeing conflict on every fucking corner. Yeah. You, you just, every corner, everyone would be shouting at each other. Everyone would be scrapping. You don't see that. You don't see that. You walk down the high street anywhere, anywhere. You say hello to someone. Someone, if someone says hello to you. They, sal they salute you back. You walk into the shop, and it's a cashier who's got a different skin color to you. You don't, you don't say anything. You, see, you just do another human being. You courteous to them. They're courteous to you. You walk past a, a mosque. You walk past a church. You walk past a, um, oh shit! What are the, what's the, what are the Jewish? Uh, synagogue. synagogue. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Jews. You walk past a synagogue. <laughs> but you know what I mean. You, you don't. You don't. Go past there and start spitting or just kicking off, which is 
what probably if he had the ability to do that on social media, you'd get people doing that yeah. because of anonymity and all, and just oh outrage and all that. You don't get that in, real, in the real world, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a it's a crazy place to be, and it, it's not the best place to go to try and gauge what what society is like in the real world. Strange place, strange place. Do you uh, so where do you frequent? I mean, we're going right off tangent here. You you're on Facebook, obviously. That's dying of death, by the way. Yeah. Dying of death. Instagram, Twitter. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. Twitter. Don't use them very much. Um, Twitter's mental. I think I've missed the boat on Twitter. I think I've... Uh, oh, no, the boat's still very much there. You can jump on that boat. You haven't missed the boat on Twitter. That's yeah. that, that's, the, that's the best place for... That's the best place for what is going on right now. Like news. Oh, my God. So, you know, if there's an, an event on now... Uh, something's going down. Twitter's the place to be. Facebook's a bit weird. Instagram, TikToks. That's good for marketing. Can't anyway. balance. <laughs> <laughs> I one lie. para, mate. One para. I lie. I'm <laughs> awesome dancing. <laughs> After about 10 of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um. <laughs> so, seven book series. So, how do you, how do you plan out... How, so you, you, you said, I don't think you said you planned a series before the first book. You wrote the first book and went, okay, there's more to this. So you've have you mapped out the whole overarching plot to a seven book series then? Yeah, but only in as much as like one one or two word themes for each of the books in the towards the end of the series. So there's um, different subplots that are going on that are going to build. And I, I want it to be a... I want it to finish at seven because I think that's just a nice number and it will help me tell the whole story of the emerging terror group that kind of comes to light towards the end of the first book. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got rough outline themes for the last three. The one I've just started has got a firm storyline. I've got that mapped out almost to paragraph, uh, so to, to chapter level. Um but best one in the world. You can write out your ideas for your, your chapters and then by the time you've got to the third one down the line, it's already changed and you've, you've probably added another five chapters in and the end's finished and changed about four times. So, um, yeah, we'll see We'll see where the third book takes us. But broadly speaking, it's looking like seven books, which fits nicely. And then I've got... I'm, like I say about writing notes down for ideas, I've got two book ideas outside of the series already to go. Um, three, if you take a completely random one about the pop industry that seeded itself <laughs> in my head. <laughs> What's the plot for that one? Tell me. I oh, know it's it's, um, it's it's based on relationships in in the uh, pop industry. Um, yeah, I won't, won't give it away. Okay, it, it may never happen. <laughs> I've got these weird ideas about um, launching it as a female writer, Josephine Mitchum, and getting in drag for all the <laughs> photo <fire> shoots. <laughs> Definitely one power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to ask you then? It sounds like you enjoy it. You enjoying the writing. Do you see it? Do you do you see it becoming your main? your main work sort of the main breadwinner at some point is that the aspiration yeah potentially um the, re the reviews and feedback i've got um sort of point towards it going well um and each of the books everyone's sort of said better than the last uh, so hopefully i'm build it, building the style and it's it's getting there well mate i thought the first one's a cracker like for a first book like, fucking hell man Fair you man. know couldn't pick any holes and it was gutted. I've got to find something. I've got to find something wrong with this. One power. I've got to find something wrong with this. I couldn't. Like really, you know. Yeah. The so the, some advice I got from a BAFTA winner of writer. He 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 basically did me a favour of giving me half an hour of his time on Zoom after I'd sent some feedback on one of his writers because he's now got his own publishing company, um, and I know one of his writers. I even after his editors and proofers have been through it, I, I found about two pages of errors sent them to them, said, there you go, correct those before you get it published. And in return for that, he gave me half an hour chat on Zoom. He'd read my f uh, book, the watch list. And um, yeah, he said, right, you can do this, you can do that. You haven't got any worries there. Gave me a few pointers. He said, if you really want to make a success of it, he said, get your fifth or sixth book out 
and then invest like four grand in Amazon advertising on the first book. Um, and then if people people start buying it, which they will with that much advertising, um, they'll then start reviewing. So you'll get more reviews. I've already got 100 reviews with 4.7 stars, but they said that'll jack right up. And then from reading that, most of them will read the second one. And then most of the people that read the second one will read the third one and so on. And so five or six books is like the, the key number so that people are reading it enough. And if you get to the point where, all right, this is really picking up, there's hundreds of thousands of people reading it, then you go full time and then you, you're smashing out books seven, eight, nine, whilst that you've still got that audience. So that was the advice I've been given. So, yeah, I'm doing loads of social media um, promotion on, on Facebook and I did a, a mini blog tour uh, with four uh, independent bloggers for the third book. But apart from that, I'm not really pushing it. I'm not investing in advertising. Um, but say a couple of books time, then there'll be a huge push on, on the watch list and, uh, see if we can, the, the trick is to get those, those initial sales, those reviews, that feedback. And then by the time you've spent your 4,000 pounds on, on advertising, Amazon starts picking up on the fact that, oh, this is a good seller. And then it self perpetuates the advertising. You don't need to pay for it anymore. So that'll be how that works. Uh interesting hmm. with the experience of the tall ships would you would you ever do think about writing anything about uh old school tall ship um uh what's, what's the word i was gonna say there escapades you know galleons and Not naval so warfare and piracy but no no spoilers there is a maritime festival in the third book okay <laughs> you mentioned maritime festival actually yeah yeah Paul Godinus is convinced that you you only got involved with tall ships because you wanted to be a pirate in a previous life. I'm not so sure. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but is that something that would you would write about? Um, not necessarily uh, things at sea, but um, like I say the the the, the festivals, um, the, the great events. I mean, they're they're all based around ships that are, are charities, and they they take anyone that wants to pay but mo they're really aimed at sort of people from difficult backgrounds young people and and give them a life-changing experience so when you see the um jubilee sailing trust with their free rig uh free mast rig um ship sailing out it's been converted for wheelchairs they kids the disabled kids that go on board can do pretty much anything they, they can get winched up into the rigging and do everything that the able-bodied people can do they take blind people on board. Um, one of the trustees for the Jubilee Sailing Trust um, is, is a blind fella. Um, uh, yeah, and he's he's been sailing most of his life. So yeah, there's huge opportunities. And and while while I was working on the projects at Sunderland, we managed to get sponsorship for about 160 kids uh, to go on the tall ships and sail across the Denmark as part of the first leg of the 2018 race series. Um, so hopefully there's some good legacy there for the city. Isn't that pretty hardcore work? I mean, uh, how hardcore is that effort there? Because I, I remember being on a, a when I was serving and we sailed from the, I sailed across the Bay of Biscay. We were on a little 55 foot there. I'm trying to recall. Maybe it was one mast. I don't know. There was like three washes of four. It was eight, Classic. seven, eight, seven reg blokes, <laughs> toms, <laughs> and then. Yeah, seven or eight reg blokes, and then four, four um, naval, naval, naval folk from from the equivalent of colonel down submarine as well. But that was uh, that was hard work, man. Yeah, hard work. So on one of those, I mean, three masts. Those things are unbelievably big. Yeah, and that, that cannot that, be easy. That they have a crew of maybe sort of fifty people on a watch. Um, fifty. Yeah, yeah, they they'll sail with a couple hundred people on board. Some of the big ones. Holy shit! Yeah, the big Russian ones, especially. <coughs> How yeah. old are these ships? Oh, some of them are over a hundred years old. That is crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Some of them are just converted fishing vessels, um, but others are, yeah, I say, proper authentic old schooners. Um, What's a schooner? Um, old trade like um. Trade trade vessels. Okay, so yeah. massive storage on board, big sails. 
Yeah, and then they range in sizes. So you have um, Class A, like the big free riggers, um, and Class B, the sort of slightly smaller ones. They sort of just go uh, sort of down the scale to your Class Ds, which would be like your um, single mast ones that you'd experience with low level military AT adventure training. Um, but yeah, fantastic. I'd say life changing. People compare a one week um, voyage on a, on a tall ship with the first five weeks of being in the military. Really? So you know, like you have the oh, little Johnny's come back and he's ironing his clothes and he's tidying his bedroom. <coughs> well, that that's similar to going on a tall ship. Imagine having to immediately bond with the people in your cabin. You might be in a four person room, uh, having to keep everything ship shape. <laughs> Um, and and taking responsibility for your actions and being part of a team. So on a, on the tall ship that I sailed across to Sweden on in 2016 with eight of our sail training ambassadors from Sunderland, we um, we were in watches of eight, I think, and um, we had to do everything from uh, shifts in the kitchen to navigating and steering the ship, uh, washing the decks, uh, raising and lowering the masts. Um, uh, the the sails, yeah. So the kids really learn to take responsibility, and uh, yeah, it's definitely helped them grow up a little bit over a period of a week. How old are the kids that you're taking on? Um, for tall ships, we take from fourteen and and above. So we had young adults as well, people that have been through the foster system. Um, yeah, really good seeing coming out the other end smiling and knowing that their life wasn't just consigned to doing minimum wage jobs and being stuck in uh, the city they were born in and they could go on and do bigger and better things. Uh, that's why we had to sell training ambassadors was because it was all well and good me in my suit going to a school and saying, oh, you can go and sail across to Denmark. Hmm. <laughs> uh, fucking cheers <laughs> for that. Um, whereas if we got a kid from their school to go and do it and we said, right, you're doing that. And we, uh, we had each of the schools in Sunderland put forward someone to do it. Uh, they'd go on that voyage and then go back to their school and say they've got sponsored places you can go and do what I did I, I, I sailed five days across the North Sea and then we had a two day party in Cadiz or wherever they, we sent them on their, their sail train ambassadors trip and uh, yeah so we hopefully changed the lives of about 160 kids in one of the most deprived parts of the North East I mean talk about a different experience like a life change something well just a different life experience you know you're not even on land some of those kids have probably never been in a plane, never probably never been in a boat. Like, I, I argue, no, it's probably less likely you've ever been in a boat compared to being on a plane. Yeah. And then you send them out, send, send, sail across the ocean. Mental. <laughs> Mental. I mean, th- literally a world apart from what you know. A world apart from what you know, like you say, forced to... You've got an element of fear there as well, right? So it's uh, it's very it's, it's probably a very different thing. It's very, uh, probably easier to motivate people to work as part of a team and achieve an aim when there's a little bit of an increased fear about or and an, uh, a bit of the unknown because they're going to say like a fish out of water with like a <laughs> like a human <laughs> off land you know sitting across the ocean because I, I <coughs> water f- frightens me I, I've got a, a, fe- a fear of it um, the ocean I should say I don't like not knowing what's but I don't like not knowing what's below me I fucking hate it mm. um, and that sort of it makes it for me that getting involved with water makes it a bit well very exciting but not always in the positive way uh yeah that is incredible to be able to provide the opportunity actually incredible because it can't be cheap either to do no to to sponsor one of the kids onto one of the ships obviously it depends on the size and the age and the organization of the of, of the tall ship but um it could be as cheap as 600 pounds for a small class d or if you're going on one of the big sort of corporate owned um class A vessels they're up to about fourteen hundred pounds for the for the trip. And then if you're getting off at um where do we go in Denmark, then you've got to fly back. So that has to be so we we put together packages for sponsors to say, right, you you'll pay um sort of twelve uh, sort of fifteen, sixteen hundred pounds for a sail trainee and that'll cover everything they need. And that averaged out across the prices so um yeah what's the significance of denmark when it comes that to was just the the each um tall ships race has a um it's almost like 
host ports bid to be part of a race in a particular year, say Sunderland have bid to be in the 2018 tool ships races, and then Sail Train International, the organising body, um, they they look at the, the host ports that have put in bids for that particular year, and they say, right, okay, so we've got Sunderland bid in, and we've got um, Harlingen, we've got Stavanger. Um, so they, they put together the race the, based on who's bid, what would make a good route, which parts of the sea they want to cover, um, and then they they basically set the route and pick the host ports. That host port then sort of pays the fee to take part, and then has to host the ships, meet all the criteria for providing what the ships need. I can they get them the water, the fuel, the services they need, and put on the a decent party um, for the for the ships while they're in town. So there's a, a four day program. Um, which includes uh, like a festival day where there's parades, parade of sail. You have to put on sports activities and competitions for the crews to do while they're in port. Uh, yeah, it's a full-on program, and it's a, as well as being a bit of an investment for the host port. Um, they 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 tend to make back in terms of local economy. I think Sunderland made about fourteen million pounds of extra spend in the local economy, which. Uh, Kind of help helps to offset the That's cost of, of running it. It's a huge amount, actually. Yeah. Did you? So did you have to do sailing courses and sailing qualifications then? Nah, nah. I just I went on one of the voyages, <laughs> as I say, over to Sweden, but as a sail trainee myself. So the, the, the only things you learn is really while you're in port, you know, the orientation of the ship, uh, what does what, where the where the life jackets are, um, and everything else you kind of learn on the hoof under the watch leader. And the watches are led by typically ad- adult volunteers, uh, some professional, some um, pure volunteers. Um, and again, that that's a really good opportunity for like veterans like you and I. We could go and join a ship's company as a volunteer and be that person providing the mentoring and guidance to the sail trainees. And um, that way you get your place on the ship and you get to sail for free um, just by being one of the volunteers. Uh, do you get sa- seasick? No, I, I have done before on on ferries in rough seas, but um, luck- I was lucky not to get su- seasick on the tall ship. Mm. Is it less likely on the tall ship? Um, I, I think it's probably more down to the conditions rather than the mm. the ship. Probably, no, I, I, I don't know. So like we that, two or that three trip I was in Tatters, and there was a, there was a lad there who was um. He didn't eat for two days. We he, 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 he threw food out the other way for two days, non-stop, sick for two days. I think, yeah, the reason I ask about it is, is it less like it's a tall ship, I think, because they just sort of move less, don't they? The, it's that small little thing was getting chucked about across that, across, um, across the Bay of Biscay. Oh, my God. When you're off watch, you couldn't sleep. You know, it's just uh, horrendous. But then when we got to Spain... When we get it's been all calmed down. The sun, the sun was out, obviously, and there was a, a school of dolphins. With, with, with alongside, you know, you think, oh man, is this is this a bit surreal. It's actually happening. Mm-hmm. School of dolphins came alongside. I think we saw a whale off at a distance at one point. I definitely think I remember seeing that, or have I just invented it in my head since. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it does sound like an amazing experience on tall ships. I like the idea of the history of it. I'd love to be on something old, something old, and just be in a cabin somewhere and looking at it and going, oh my god. What characters have been in a year before me, hundred years ago? Yeah, some what, of the old what? Swedish and Norwegian ships. Um, yeah, just amazing. Oh Everything's like carved out of oak and um, yeah, antiquities from like decades and decades ago. Yeah, unreal. I don't realise the history of our, we have at our fingertips. I think I think we, I think we're, we take it for granted sometimes. When I say we, I mean British, mainland European. Just so much there, and a, a reason it's popped in my head is over well, the last sort of week or so is I can't remember what I was listening to. It might have been one of the Rogan podcasts, and they were talking about you know um, the history of the United States is what a few hundred years, a few hundred years, and they were saying I think they, someone said something like yeah you know they got they got um, theaters there or pubs there are like six hundred years old I think six and the rest and the rest. You know, in, in, we were talking about Colchester earlier before we came on the podcast. 
where I used to live in the centre of Colchester, a little flat in the centre of, Col- centre of Colchester, maybe maybe a two minute walk from there, right in the centre of, ta- centre of town, which most people will never walk past to live in Colchester because it's off the high street. It's this little back street. You don't need to walk past it. It's like a church that was built in 300 odd AD, 400 odd AD. This thing is old as fuck. Just a little bit younger than Jesus Christ himself, if you believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, wow, there, edge of your fingertips. You know, just mental. We do take it for granted. There's so much to be learned from it. Yeah, I'd love to get one of that. I'd have to get more information off you about that, the tall ship stuff after, actually. I, the sooner it's, I do, I feel, I feel strongly, and I've done for, for quite a few years about volunteering and helping people that do things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do, only just to get experience. Because as you, well, you, you know, uh, the more diverse experience you can have, the more informed you are. And I just think the more opportunity you've got as a person for growth in whatever capacity that is, personal, professional, fucking whatever, you know. And uh, that is what that is what people who are poverty-stricken, adults or kids, are, are deprived of. You know, it's... Uh, it goes back to the it's sort of similar line with the old networking thing, uh, the importance of networking. The importance of networking is not, oh, let's just have lots of people I know. It's not. It's 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 about having people you can re- reach out to for help if you need it, if you're in your state, but also you, the the diversity of knowledge that you learn from those people, even if you only meet them once. You know, you're learning something. Well, look at this conversation. I'm learning something from you from you. The tall ships aspect. You know, the 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 process of writing, how you go, th- how you go through it. I'm l- learning things. May not be useful to me, but what if someone asked me about writing a book? Or what if someone asked me about, oh, I'm looking to do some volunteering. Any ideas what I could go and do? Blah 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 blah. I go, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, my mate Joe, yeah, he said this. Get in touch. You know, it's uh, mm-hmm. it's huge, which means I'm a sort of a more positive influence on the people around me. Um, because back to the point of those those people don't have the opportunities to go and experience things. Because of whatever reason, life circumstances. If you can give that to them, it's fucking brilliant. I'd love to be part of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, as well as the ship's volunteers uh, that help run the voyages, um, to to run the event in Sunderland itself, we had to recruit 250 volunteers. Um, and they were like the games makers that you'd get at Olympic mm-hmm. Games. Uh, but then we also had the technical uh, liaison officers. We had um, admin volunteers with this whole whole fleet of people that just gave up their time for free and there there were people from across the spectrum from people with special needs that just wanted to be part of the event to people that were like highly professional lawyers or um, doctors that just wanted to give up some of their time to do something for the community and be part of a big event in in their city Um, and that that was kind of inspirational to me as the person that recruited and, and trained them and after that, I thought, well, I'm going to do that as well. So I went and did the Cricket World Cup the following year at Durham. And um, I told them about my experience, but I wasn't worried about getting involved with the whole organisation piece. But uh, I put myself in the driving team. So I was driving cricketers and their wives backwards and forwards from Newcastle to the um, Chester Street Stadium. Um, but yeah, it was a really good experience and recommend it to anyone. There's, um, there's like the mainstream third party sector which everyone sort of thinks of as sort of helping helping out soup kitchens and food banks and things like that but there's also the uh the sort of more fun side of volunteering at the big events so commonwealth games i know working with that at the moment um but they've got a huge um volunteer organization helping um one of the guys i'm up at sunderland he he goes over to the masters and helps volunteer there as as like an usher and a marshal (laughs) so there's unbelievable opportunities that not just investing your time and doing something good but having a blast as well so uh, yeah keep an eye there's nothing wrong with that no there's nothing (laughs) wrong with that you know what I mean you know it's uh, there's a yeah there's nothing wrong with getting the benefit from something when you're you're helping out and volunteering in fact I think it's a lot everything (coughs) every decision you make even with the volunteer inside all comes down there is always an element of selfishness I honestly, th- I honestly think it, um, and and but not in a bad way. So you ultimately do it. if you decide I'm going to do this because it's the right thing, you know I'm going to give some money to this homeless person, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z, um, and you can th- you can think 
you can naively think, oh, I'm doing, I'm only doing this because it's the right thing to do. But you're doing the right thing because it, it's the right thing because you, at some level, it makes you feel good that yeah. you're doing the right thing. Positive and there's nothing to wrong use. with it. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. And people forget that, I think. But and, well, I think, and the reason I highlight this is because I think when you, when you paint it like that, I think it's an inhibitor to more people being a positive influence society voluntarily. Because it, they they don't wanna, they think they don't want to appear selfish in their endeavour. When uh, there's always a little element there that is in the subconscious level, you're doing it because the right thing and the right thing makes you feel good. I'm fucking quite happy to admit that. You know, quite happy to admit it. But um, no, about 100. percent yeah, well, especially with a person like yourself, so busy. One with your work, two with the books, and then taking time out to go and volunteer. You know, we, we did the patrons icebreaker call, uh, icebreaker interview before this, and you know, there's a, a several of the patrons are. You know, they, well, fucking most of the patrons actually are just out their way, spend lots of time volunteering to try and improve other people's life purely because they have the capacity to do so. You know, and, and they understand the impact of providing those alternative experiences that people would otherwise not get. And like to your point, that is done through, mainly through the, the availability of volunteers. Otherwise, it cost a fucking bomb. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd yeah. have to be run. Uh, you'd have to be a profit-making organization that's running it, and then you wouldn't get the same benefit. You know, you wouldn't have the same kind of people running it, same kind of emotional investment in it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What's um? Have you given any thought to the next book series, even though the first one's not finished? Um, Are you going to stay on the military theme? Yeah, I think. Um Definitely mili- military characters as central roles. Um, yeah, I've got like I said, I've got a couple of ideas that seem to be standalone books. But then again, I thought the watch list was a standalone book when I f- when I started it. So you, I don't think you can really say whether it'll be a standalone or a series until you get to the end. And if it's got a cliffhanger that naturally presents itself, then take that and that's your stepping stone onto the next project. Um, so again, without spoilers. So I know now what the stepping stone is to the second book. So you didn't realise about... I'm not going to say what the stepping stone is, but you didn't realise that stepping stone until you finished the first book. No. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Oh, because to me it's obvious, but it's only because it's written in written form. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting, yeah, it's interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought that was planned, didn't it? No. no it was um, fortunate that I'd left it the way it was. And... Um, like I say, the culmination of the second book fitted in nicely with that stepping stone, and it was, like I say, an organic process that has worked out. Yeah, yeah, that's good. The uh, the end of the first one's a shocker, <laughs> bit of a shocker. Didn't quite expect it to go that way at all. Gutted, I was gutted in some ways. Gutted. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird trying to talk about this without giving away spoilers. So yeah. come on, like you know, the first we will, we've got a, we've got, a, got a few minutes left. So the uh, the first we got we got three. The first book's the watch list. The second book is uh, 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 where is Tony Blunt. The third book's um, hitting home. So yeah, on the watch. I mean, we were talking, you know, we were talking before. I have not been into fiction for a long time. Uh, I used to belt feed fiction, belt feed it. I was a big Lee Child fan. It's a big um, Michael Connolly fan. Just those series of books. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother got me into those, actually. But again, the military connection. Uh, on the Lee Child side and the Michael Connolly side with those characters, that military connection, you can you just sort of resonate with it. But then for some reason, I went away from fiction when I left. And I think, it's just, I think it was because I wanted to be productive in what, everything I was doing from reading. So if I was reading, I have to be learning, got to be learning, got to be, you know, everything to be productive. Uh, but well, it's not about. It. So your is yours is the first fiction book I've read in. Man, I can't think how long. I mean, five plus years, mm, five plus between five and ten years, and absolute pleasure to read it. You know, you know, I've already told you I've left the Amazon review, but I mean, genuinely, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't bullshit. Really, really enjoyed it. Really engaging. And I read it on Kindle, right? And I flew through it on Kindle because on the Kindle, it's set so it tells me, I don't know if you've got a Kindle, but it tells you what percentage of the book is left or what percentage of the chapter is left. I was fucking flying through it. And then when you 
gave me the physical copy of the book today, I looked and thought, no, it's not that big. I can't believe how big it is. I thought it was much shorter because I was, fl- you know, when you're enjoying something, you fly through it, you want, it just ends a lot quicker than you want it to end. Yeah. So yeah, fucking flew through it. Could, literally couldn't put it down. Couldn't put it down. I managed to bang through it. I've, I've started on the second book now. I'm looking forward to, looking forward. To, if, I, if I started the second book late yesterday and I'm on 19% as of this morning. I mean, I woke up this morning and started reading straight away in bed, like eight o'clock. Like reading away, cool. <laughs> it's good, mate. <laughs> They're really engaging books. You know, I I I like it. You're not. Um, you struck a really good balance between going full on over the top military terminology and you know you, uh, and just things that most people wouldn't understand terminology and phrases and especially the military slang. Mm-hmm. But there's enough in there that it is blatantly written by a military bloke. Uh, the way the storylines are, the way the little anecdotes are, the way the way the little subplots and things happen are really, I think, are really accurate. They're really, uh, it, you, you can tell when something's bullshit, right? You can tell when an author's writing about something and they've got no experience about it. They go, oh, hmm, <laughs> hmm, I don't know if this is right, but in this case, it's not. Really good, really engaging books. I like it. The character's really exciting. Well, you know, because I, I messaged you a couple of times going, is this character based on someone? I would like to tell you this character's based on. I want to know. <laughs> is this a real life person because of fucking quality? And, uh, yeah, mate, quality, like, generally, generally. For a first book, you would think I was your third, fourth, fifth, sixth book. I re- you know, I really enjoyed it. So, um, looking forward to the rest, reading the rest, looking forward to the whole series. Uh, people who are listening or watching. So the first book by Joe is called The Watch List on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon's yeah. the best place to get it. Have you audio booked it? No, I looked into it. It's quite expensive to get recorded pro- professionally. Um, it's gonna is be it? 1,500 quid for a professional recording artist. Um, but you know what comes at the part of that card? Uh, why wouldn't you audio book it yourself? Well, I tried reading the first chapter, recorded it on my phone, and listening back to it, it sounded like David Beckham was having a stroke, and I thought, no one wants to listen to that. So uh, I looked into the pricing. Um, but like I say, if it, if it picks up and it takes off, then uh, it's definitely something I'd do, because there's loads of people who said they'd listen to it. But while it's still almost hobby stage, I'm not going to invest that much. Well, if you yet. didn't find, if you didn't want to do it yourself, but you, we want to record an artist, and you want to reduce the cost. There's only I know a studio, mm. I know a studio <laughs> that you could use. Yeah, for mates <laughs> rates for like zero bucks. Yeah, honestly. So if you yeah. want to, you know, yeah. So um, if you, I said, I was going to say because I, my preference is always for people to do it themselves. But then, I've never considered fiction. Fiction's a bit different. But it's, it's, it's the audiobook has two sides to it. Isn't it? The, the audiobooks I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and you either get one where if someone's narrating the so whoever's read narrating the book or reading the book, audio book in the book, the vocal artist, the voice artist, they either do it so they, they use the same voice all the way through, even for different characters. Mm-hmm. Or they put on different accents for different characters. It depends what you want, doesn't it, I suppose. And that's down to you. It depends what you want. But um, yeah, no, studio show if you want to use it. Hundred percent, hundred percent, no drama. That's reduced cost, but uh yeah, definitely more audiobook. In. I think more people are moving towards audiobooks because of time. Yeah. People are less willing to sit, do nothing. Sit with them reading something. Yeah, they yeah. want to multitask. They want to be in the car, listen to audiobook. I started audiobook in the gym now. I, I would go to the gym and not have anything. I don't go with the heady headphones or anything. The last, in fact, it's because of your fucking book. No, 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 it can't be yours. It's not an audiobook. What was I listening to? <laughs> something else. Going into the gym last week and audiobook in, in the gym. What was I listening to? wasn't fiction, I know that. Yours is the only fiction we did. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. But um, anyway, no, back to my point. You want to use your studio. It's not a drama. It's not a drama. So apart from Amazon, where can... Is there anywhere else people should go? Connect with you, follow you, books? See, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a, so people listen, I'll put... Sorry, to, I know you're going to jump in there. I'll ask you a question and talk right over you. Uh, I'll put the link to Joe's Amazon author profile in the blurb of this podcast. So if you're listening on that podcast or Spotify or YouTube, or whatever, look in the description on the link to this thing will be in there. Where else, Joe? Yeah, I'm um, on Facebook and Twitter and uh, what's the trendy one? Instagram. Instagram. Trendy? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you call it trendy? <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on those. And if anyone wants signed copies, I, uh, I can post them out, my author copies. Um, not a problem. How do people, oh, so just contact you on Instagram. Yeah, Facebook. direct message or put a comment on one of the pictures or something. I'll pick it up. Oh, sweet. 
Excellent. Mate. Yeah. Cost, cost a couple of quid extra for the postage, but yeah. Right. Been an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, mate. And I look forward to reading the rest of the books. Yeah, well done. Cheers. Cool. Thanks for having me. No worries. My pleasure, dude. Ah, Paul Godonis. Thank you, Paul, again. Yeah, cheers, Paul. For the intro. <laughs> <laughs> mate, good luck with the rest of them. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, you. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the Hey Chower patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the HR Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H-Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H-Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.